Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall, at the Spectator Buildings in London. Today I'm joined by Rosie Kay and it's a day for celebration because Rosie has just launched K2 CEO, her new dance company. But the reason behind why she even had to start a new dance company in the first place is a little sad, perhaps to say the least. Um, but uh, Rosie's here to tell us all about that. Rosie, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. So can you, uh, before we talk about the exciting new project you've got, can you tell us about your story and why you've had to start anew? Um, so I'm a dancer and choreographer. Um, I've danced since I was very, very young. And I've been lucky enough to have it as the sort of meaning of my life really. Um, I danced professionally for quite a few years, mostly abroad, um, but also in the UK. And then I almost gave up. I kind of went down the wrong track and I realised that I wanted to actually be a choreographer. I wanted to make my own work. So in 2004, I returned to the UK. Um, I set up my own dance company, Rosie K Dance Company, and I started to explore uh, the funding uh, with the Arts Council and making at first solo and duet work and then I built up to sort of large scale productions. So um, I was, we were doing quite well and we applied to get regular funding um, and I was advised at the time to turn my company that was limited by share into a charity and under English law I had to voluntarily step down as a director. Um, and I became an employee, but but it was still my name, and I was the sole artistic creator, and I earned the money, and you know I, I, I ran the company basically. So to, I, I really still felt it was my company, mm -hmm. and I had a board of trustees, um, who, many of whom I'd known for many many years, um, and it was quite a sort of hands off approach. I just got on making my work. I, I'd say that my work has had a political element and I'm interested in the world we live in and so at times I'd skirted with controversial subject and so when we set up the charity um, I very deliberately you know put into the charitable objects that um, this company existed for the artistic creation of Rosie Kay mm -hmm. to look at controversial and taboo subject matters shining a light on on difficult subjects so, so what would be an example of, of some of those? so a great example would be five soldiers so um, quite a while ago I suffered a really bad injury on stage and following the sort of I was told that I wouldn't dance again and it would take me about a year to walk again. It was like full knee reconstruction, I was told. And following the operation, where it turned out not to be that bad, I dreamt I was on a desert battlefield and my leg had been blown off. And it made mm. me question ideas about the body and the soul and the relationship between the body and the soul. So I'd have done anything to get back on stage and dance again and, you know, you could I could lose my arms and my legs, but would I still want to dance? Yes, I would. And I went downstairs and it was the Iraq war at that time. And there was a lot of kind of antipathy about why we were at war, particularly in Iraq. And and, and the, the argument had never really gone that, that deeply into it. And so I was looking at the faces of young soldiers killed in Iraq. And I wondered, how do you train the body to prepare for war? Mm. And maybe they're a bit more like dancers than we realise. Maybe they love what they do. And so that set me on a long journey. I spent time with an infantry battalion training mm. with them. I spent time at Headley Court looking at the rehabilitation of injured soldiers. And by that stage, the war had moved to Afghanistan and these huge numbers of soldiers were coming back, having survived multiple complex trauma, um, when in Iraq they wouldn't have survived. So that sort of golden window of survival had um, massively got better in Afghanistan, but mm. people were living from injuries that they wouldn't have lived off several years previously in war. So I got access to soldiers, sort of the training, the breaking and the putting back together again of their bodies mm. at a time when nobody else was was allowed to actually. Um, so I made a work about it. And when we first toured it, the MOD phoned up and tried to get the, the show <laughs> stopped because it was the time of the 2010 elections. So I was able to say <clears throat> to the MOD, well, actually, it's a free country. This is not, um, I'm not a politician and this is a work of art and I'm allowed to put this on. What, why would they have wanted it to be? So it was uh, it Perda at the time, and so um, the press and politicians were not allowed to talk about the war 
in mm. Afghanistan during the 20, during the election, there's that period where you're not allowed to talk about the war. Okay. Well, 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 but until I think it was David Cameron got in in 2010. Yeah. So, so me just having a show that was on the news in the on the radio, it was on the Today program talking about it, that they were got worried. Uh -huh. They thought, you're not allowed to do that. But but I was like, yes, I am, actually. So I suppose some, a show like that, it, it changed perceptions, not just of the general public, it, it, in that it humanised soldiers. But it, I can say it even changed perceptions within the army itself, mm -hmm. who went from being quite uh, resistant and a bit worried about me to actually supporting and you know, putting some money towards the, the show touring the past few years. So that's been quite remarkable to work yeah. at, with the military at that sort of level through the arts. It's been kind of, a, you know, blows away your stereotypes and preconceptions on all fronts. Yeah. You're not scared of controversy, obviously, and yet, uh, and so uh, last year, if I understand this correctly, you wanted to put on a production of Orlando by Virginia Woolf, which was stepping into the trans debate so i i actually was in in like 10 days away from premiering um a, another work romeo and juliet which i'd set in contemporary birmingham and i'd worked with uh west midlands police gang former gang members uh really intensely with uh, a school in spark hill looking at the themes of romeo and juliet knife crime mm. uh, child marriage gang gang culture um, and then putting this show together. So I had a, a young cast of nine dancers, uh, a lot of whom were very inexperienced. And there was just something funny going on in the studio. Uh, I, I put it down to COVID. Um, what do you mean funny? The mood was funny? The or? mood was funny. I just found that people weren't as open as normal. And I started to sort of just be, first of all, I was, my, my father was going through the very horrible end of life with, with oh, terminal cancer. Right. So I, I at first put it down to the fact that I was really quite sensitive and it was really difficult because I couldn't see him very often because of the COVID restrictions. Um, but then I, I just found that talking to them, they, 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 they didn't seem very open. They didn't seem as collaborative as I would normally expect for dancers. And um, I wanted to kind of, relax them and and show that I really cared about them you know what age are these dancers um, sort of in their in their uh, early to mid 20s okay so they they're sort of starting out yes. and so it's a new generation yes yes and and so you you, you can't sort of quite tell what they're thinking was it a sort of mood of self-censorship were they getting on with each other or were they just finding it hard to communicate with you yeah I, I, I couldn't tell because we, we had such strong restrictions we weren't even allowed to eat lunch together we had to sit what? sort of like oh, because, because of COVID, of COVID yeah. yeah so we had to sit at different places in the, in the studio yeah. and you, you would sort of snatch one-to-one -one conversations but um I started to just feel a bit uncomfortable. I, I, I thought some, I did think something was going on. Looking back, uh -huh. something was going on. Um, I, I noticed it like in, like I'll teach class. And if I gave a correction, I would see eyes rolling and I would be like, well, hang on. You know, I've taught for, for 25 yeah. years. I, I, I'm not telling you because I think you're wrong or, 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 or you're, you know, because I'm trying to assert my power I'm telling you because this is technically really important and this saves your knees and this is what you need to do you know like it's a really technical is that a problem with authority they had or I think so yes so it's a generational that generation maybe had a, a problem with being told what to do by I, anyone I think so I think there's an element of that and there's a real pedagogic tradition in dance like we we I would say I'm a quite a democratic choreographer I invite um you know people to give me their ideas, their creativity, and then I use it. But I can also make works where I'm like, this is the choreography and this is how you do it and you need to do it in this way because that's the result I want. You know, yeah. that's your role as a choreographer, as, as a director. Yeah. There are times to be really opening and sharing and then there's times where you have to be like, this is how good you have to be. Mm -hmm. This was a show on one of the biggest stages in the UK. There was a lot of pressure on it. And these dancers didn't have experience in that. I do. Mm -hmm. So I was, I just didn't feel like I was being, um, like they were very generous. I didn't feel they were very generous to me. Uh -huh. And that was quite odd. I'm not used to that. I feel like it's a, it's a fantastic place, this studio. You can, yeah. you know, we're making it up, guys. Like, <laughs> exactly. And they should have been 
felt lucky to have the opportunity to work with you in the first place. So I imagine, given they had no experience and you've got an incredible uh, uh, career behind you to, you know, for them to learn from. It, it was a fantastic show. We had amazing music. We were using the Berlioz score. We had fantastic opportunities to do it with a live orchestra. Uh, the whole staging, the costumes was fabulous. And you've got to bear in mind, most people were completely unemployed right through yeah, COVID. It was, a, it was a nightmare for freelancers. So yeah. I really felt like it was my duty to try and keep going and offer people work as yeah. much as I possibly could. So in that context, you bring up Orlando by Virginia Woolf as a, as a proposition for a new pro production. So, so, so I invited the dancers to my house. They, they, they stayed till too late, um, and 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 I regret, you know, not not listening to my. Well, husband it's a party. It's, like, it's a big rave. There's a big rave happening well, at your house. Sort of, but it was still. It wasn't crazy because you know the gardens next to my son's bedroom. You know, okay. we, weren't, we weren't being ridiculous. Um, what what they did was they asked me what my next show was, and I was about two years into preparation for Orlando. And I was just about to put an audition notice out. Okay. Um, and I'd already been having that week a few arguments or, or, or debates uh, about the wording of this uh -huh. audition notice. And, and someone very junior in my company had sort of reworded it to sort of include gender euphoria or something like this. And I was like, hey, hang on. I, I'm not sure. I'm just looking for a... Uh, it, it's a it's a male aristocrat. Yeah, so this is the the, the story by Virginia Woolf of yeah. Orlando. So for yeah. people who haven't heard, uh, read the book, can, can you tell us the story? Just so so it, it's it's a fantastic sort of um, it's Virginia Woolf playing with um, form and style, and she's having a lot of fun and there's a lot of humour. And we meet this young, slightly wet hero in Elizabethan England. And he wants to become a poet, but he's a dreadful poet, but he's desperately trying to be an artist. And so there's lots of kind of like discussion around what makes an artist really an artist, even though you may feel you're an artist. If your work is really dreadful, does that mean that you're an <laughs> artist or not? <laughs> and he falls in love and he gets horribly rejected. And then he becomes an ambassador in Morocco. And then at that point where there's a, there's a civil war and he's meant to grab his firearms, he actually sort of runs away and falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he's a woman. That's it. He's a woman. No further explanation. Mm. Then Orlando carries on through another three, two, three hundred years of history. So, so he, he, she never ages. Um, and the novel changes as we go through the Georgian era, and then we go into the uh, Victorian era, and then we finally end where Virginia Woolf just blasts you with her sort of 20th century stream of consciousness bang into the modern age. Oh. And so it's 400 years of English history. It's a hero turns into a heroine. So it looks at how people behave around Orlando, Orlando when they're a man and when they're a woman. But it also looks at even inheritance because Orlando as a woman can't inherit the great big country pile. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's a love letter to Vita Sackville West, who was her lover. And they had a terribly passionate relationship. Um, but Vita was also madly in love with her, her country pile that she would never inherit. Mm. Um, and so there's something in there also about, about a lesbian love affair, about sort of showing off to Vita her, her prowess. Yeah. And I just love that because you, 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 can, you can play with costume, you can play with theatricality, you can play with body, kind of like, how do we know this person's a man? How, how do we know they're a woman? I never, I, I'd, I'd been speaking to a couple of trans friends of mine and an LGBT group, book group. And I just was like, I don't know who my Orlando is. They just have to be fantastic. It's mm -hmm. the, it, it could be a man, could be a woman, could be trans, could be, I don't know. It's yeah. just got to be somebody that can be convincing. Well, obviously, Virginia Woolf would never have had any concept of what a trans person was and this is a, a, a book of fantasy in 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 a sense uh, tied in with uh, kind of the the, the history of re a reality. But uh, in in the context of twenty twenty one last year, a book like that is going to be interpreted not quite maybe how Virginia Woolf had intended. But 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 I felt like this is a this is a a, a feminist writer, a great of the twentieth century. I've positioned a female viewpoint at the centre of 
all my work since I started making work in 1998. I'm an artist that has a standing that can interpret this in the way I want to. Now, I'm also someone that sort of, um, sadly, my brother died. So, so I grew up um, with steam train posters on my wall, with um, being obsessed, with, I thought I was Tintin for a while, uh, with being on the school football team until they kicked me off, despite me being the best striker. And they said, well, I'm sorry, Rosie, you're a girl. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm someone that's kind of gone, well, if I were a boy, what would I do? What would I get away with? Yeah. That's much harder when you're a woman. Yeah. And then also being now an older, you know, older woman, I've been through enough, whether that be sexual assault, sexual harassment. Um, I've even talked about rape in one of my shows. I've been through... Uh, abortion I've been through uh, a, a really dangerous uh, pregnancy and, and birth there are things that have affected me because of my body and because of my biology that I want to talk about <laughs> that yeah. I think are really vital and interesting to talk about um, I wasn't an artist that put me and my body center place um, in terms of like the work I made I wanted to look at the world but now I'm at the age where I think, well, actually, I, I can put myself into my work as well. And I can put my own opinions into my work and be more open about that. So, you know, I'd, I'd made this solo um, adult female dancer also in 2021 and it premiered and it, and it said being a woman is not in my head. I say that in the, in the solo. So in some respects, I felt like I was starting to kind of like, I knew there was this argument going on around trans, but I also think it's something that, is a cultural phenomenon and that really interests me if we're yeah. going to redefine identity and biology i want to be looking at this this yeah. is fascinating yeah. what's going on here yeah why can't i look at it particularly uh, uh, if in in your field of choreography where the body is so integral to the art form there's a beautiful piece you wrote, you're a great prose writer as well a beautiful piece you wrote for unheard uh, at the end of last year writing a, a, about how the how your your connection with your body it's uh, and i urge listeners to uh, to to read it um but it's it's absolutely integral to to to, to what you do well i i mean i was obviously like looking at the soldier's body was such a starting point and that became such an important work for me um but then through that i also got invited to become um artist in residence at the university of oxford to the school of anthropology so i have actually even properly gone and read my Foucault and my embodiment <laughs> theory and, uh, okay. you know, I've written papers um, about the lived experience mm. and, and how we can use dance and use bodies to illuminate medical conditions such as anorexia. Oh, I've worked wow. with neuroscientists. I've looked at the connection between dance, the brain, the body. You know, I've, I've written papers on this, you know, yeah. the, the body and the connection with the mind and, and how we perceive ourselves. That That's, that's, been fundamental to my work yeah. you know before embodiment became something else you know <laughs> well can you take us back to this controversy then with with if you don't mind what happened with this troupe and how that conversation at your dinner party ended up not long after you having to resign from your own company well it, it, i'm going to do it quite briefly and in, in, in a nutshell um it, it got into quite an actual heated debate about um the difference between sex and gender and um i was explicitly asked to give my beliefs and um i i think you know i just have concerns that are quite mainstream if we erase the word woman to include anybody that can say they're a woman or self-identify as woman then we do lose some of the sex-based protections and I think like by looking at the extremes of where that takes us, um, that can tell us something about why those sex-based protections are there in the first mm -hmm. place. But but my, a lot of my words were misconstrued, misunderstood. I don't think people really listened. I think they were quite shocked that I just didn't agree with their mm. orthodoxy. I was very shocked that, that they had such a strong ideology, really shocked. Um, and the more I tried to appeal to like my own lived experience yeah. uh, the, the worse it got the worse it got so so I was in like proper shock afterwards like real shock because I'd sort of had not not all of them but a lot of them just shouting at me and I and I was really it's, it's like your worst nightmare as a choreographer because you, you're relying on these people their bodies and their minds to to play along with you to to put this thing on stage that's a creation from your imagination so if you lose them it's a bit like sort of losing your soldiers you know they're going to shoot you in the head um 
so I appealed to my, I, got, I, I really felt paralysed, really paralysed by the whole thing. So I appealed to my chair, um, who I trusted, and I thought she would help sort it out. But very, very quickly, it dawned on me that she'd actually already taken their side. Huh. And so we got through the show and then I had a so-called informal meeting and then I was told that I'd be um, investigated. Um, so I said, OK, I've never had a complaint in all my years. Um, I understand there's a process that's go through it. So we did that. It, 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 I had a sort of meeting at the end. I was exonerated. Um, I decided to put out an apology to the dancers uh, for the fact that they were so upset by what I said. Um, and then we went straight back into rehearsals again for another sort of run of shows. One of the dancers appealed, walked out, and then about three weeks later, I discovered that they were doing a second investigation. But this time, and only through accident, I found out that they were using external lawyers, uh, an HR consultant related to the lawyers, and that these lawyers were also the same firm as one of my trustees. Um, so I started to push back a bit harder, saying, well, hang on, what, what's this secondary investigation? They refused me any support on legal advice while they were using the company money. Yeah. to pay for lawyers to investigate me. There was no mutual investigation. Rosie K Productions company mon money, yeah. no less. Yeah, yeah, money that I, I'd earned through my work. They were using that money to investigate me. And then things just um, got to a real head. I, I found out some, some, some nasty stuff, some horrifically false allegations. And I could see that this investigation was... was, was that must have been so traumatizing. I mean, it, I, I, you say the first... You, you, you humbled yourself to apologize for offending, and yet they came back. But then you say that you sort of or stick up for yourself, you stood up for yourself a bit more the second time around, or did you have a change emotionally? This is one of the things I, I don't think people appreciate so much, and this is what I'm maybe trying to get at, yeah. is, the, is the, the experience of of quote unquote being cancelled, yeah. it's it's actually very emotional, particularly for people in the creative industries who are more sensitive by nature and who aren't used to being thrown into the political fray and to having people challenge them or, or uh, being disliked. It's yeah. not, it's not yeah. about being, yeah. so, so I imagine not only was the experience trauma traumatizing for you, but this was your baby that you'd you know, for 17 years you'd built up, this is, you're, you'd poured your life into, into this, so it must be very painful. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 was, it was awful, and I, I thought I was, I actually genuinely thought I was going mad, I actually thought I was going mad, and, and I was really lucky to get a, a decent doctor, and then, mm. it's quite, quite funny, I got sent to a psychiatrist, which is saying something, you know, on the, on the, on the NHS right now, and, um, I went there and I sort of had two hours talking to this um, really amazing psychiatrist. And, and I was really trying to convince her that I was completely mad. I was like, but you don't understand. I make stuff up. That's my job. You know, like I have these dreams and these visions. I'm clearly something's <laughs> like wrong with me. And, and she asked me to explain this party and this argument a couple of times. And then she, you know, she got to the end and I thought, come on, I'm mad. And, and she just, she said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. There's That's nothing so wrong with you. I could give you any drug you want. I don't think you want any drugs, but basically you're very, very stressed. You're having a terrible time at work yeah. and you might need to think about your future for your own health. Is there anything in, in, that, in that experience with all these people accusing you of, of such thing that you were like, oh, maybe they're right. Is, it was, maybe I am doing something wrong. When you say you convince yourself you're mad, is that because so many people were gaslighting you that you started to... Gaslight yourself, and 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 you know I am, you know I'm in the middle of, of creating a Romeo and Juliet that's about murder and yeah. knife crime and suicide, and I'm like completely raw and open, and then this attack comes into like this vacuum. I'm still recovering from my my dad's yeah. death, and and all I just felt was this overwhelming, terrible sense of like doom. It was just horrific. Oh, poor thing. Um, and and actually, it it was my closest family, my mum and my my husband. Who actually, my husband just said, "No, you're not mad. No, no, no. Good for you, him. Yeah, you, they they bullied you. Yeah. And looking back now, yeah, it was like it was like a kind of it it was a witch hunt. Mm. It really was. And that now I'm trying to like figure out 
the meaning of these things, the meaning of witch hunts, the, why, why do these pylons happen? Mm. Why are they happening now? Yeah. What's going yeah. on? Yeah. This is absolutely fascinating to me. Yeah. But, but I suppose I, I, you, you do go into quite a severe, you know, profound existential soul searching yeah. because you really have to go, well, why am I doing what I do? Why, why, why are my beliefs and my thoughts about reality so offensive to other people? Yeah. Well, hang on, do I still stand by them? Yes, I do. Well, then I have to get through this. You know, yeah. I have to like, um, I, I sort of found an inner metal that I'd, I'd never, I'd never known. I knew I was strong because yeah, you know, I'm a dancer, it's hard. <laughs> um, but I didn't know quite that my soul was so so tough as well. And one never expect, anticipates that one would have to go through an experience like this. You do, it's not something we were taught about in school necessarily, about that these sort of uh, phenomena are going to happen. And it is a phenomenon of, of, the, of the age in, in, in that sense. But funnily enough, actually, I, I come from... Um, so my granddad was a Polish refugee and fled... Uh, the Nazis and joined the Polish Free Army um, and married a Scottish woman. And a lot of my family were exterminated um, in Poland. And then huh. my first job as a dancer, as a professional dancer, was in Poland in the late 90s. Wow. So um, not only did I grow up with ideas around, um, you know, what happened to... I love Germany. It's the most wonderful country. I love all the literature, the music, the arts. W what happened there, and I sort of was always quite obsessed by the rise of fascism mm. um, and and also then the communist sort of uh, um, Iron Curtain that came down over Poland and then sort of thwarted Polish arts. Yeah. So I grew up with, you know, these debates at the dinner table talking about freedom, freedom of speech. Oh, really? I, I investigated Weimar artists, people like Otto Dix and this kind of shock from World War One. But then also did they capitulate or did they flee Germany mm. in the in the 30s? And then I also studied um, Weimar Republic choreographers mm. and and people like Mary Wigman and Rudolf Laban have quite ambiguous relationships to what happened with the state in the 30s in Germany um, and so then living in Poland uh, in the 90s it was post-communist but it wasn't in the EU yet it, it reminded actually it reminded me being in a post-dance theatre was a little bit like the company of Romeo and Juliet you, it, it was a little bit paranoid you had to be careful what you said uh -huh. it was quite competitive um, but my friends were all theatre practitioners and artists. And what Polish artists had learned to do under communism was make their work deeply and vastly symbolic. So they never said anything pro or against the state, but you had these incredible imagery and they would play with imagery, but nothing would ever be fixed. It would morph into something mm. else. And I've always loved that about my job at dance. It's like you can put one stereotype there, but the minute you see it, you can morph it mm. and undermine whatever you're thinking in your head. Yeah. And so playing with symbolism, playing with power, playing with reality, I, I, I think there's something interesting there. So this is an interesting time to absolutely. be an artist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, what do you think, what, what do you think's behind the, the, uh, the, the, the ideology of, of, let's say this troupe that you, 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 faced uh, you, that you were up against what do you think's driving that and what's the what's the the what is the world of of dance where where is this coming from because is it a generational thing is it all of dance i found in, in the music industry for example that it is majority progressive yeah uh, in terms of politics but um, that also uh, the kind of artists aged between 15 and 25 have quite a lot of power because they're the ones who sell the most records. And so whatever they believe does sort of dictate a lot of what the other, you know, what, what can and can't be said amongst other people within the industry. Yeah. It, by comparison with, with in dance, and uh, what does that world look like? Well... I hadn't realised that there was this ideological capture going on, and and it wasn't it hasn't been that long since I was involved in in, in universities and, and lecturing in academia. I, I was probably there just before things kind of really like I was saying about being at the school of anthropology. Uh, there certainly was no pronouns or anything coming in at that point, but there were definitely sort of arguments 
you know, of course, being anthropology as well, there were big arguments about its colonial history and, and, and history of racism, which I found fascinating and, and, and about time. So this is the thing, This I think for lots of us that are possibly this sort of like sandwich generation, um, there's an element of truth in 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 lots of these things or lots of these progressive political ideas like um you know feminists were always about destroying the gender stereotypes and i you know women can do anything that men can do men can do anything women mm. can do oh hang on but that doesn't mean that men are women or women are men you know oh hang on there are some sort of biological realities which 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 play a part mm. in why women are an oppressed majority um, you know, and then there's been this stuff around around racism, around history, around colonization. You know, there's elements of truth to all of that, and yeah. and you can kind of go, yeah, well, I agree. I agree to a certain point. I I I don't quite know why it's gone so massive and so widespread. I mean, there's there's different theories around that, and and one can sort of trace it back to probably the 1960s or certainly sort of the late 90s and sort of queer theory and critical race theory and things that seem to be on the fringe of becoming mainstream. I don't, How I don't does know. that get into dance? Are these, are these uh, kids who are studying uh, dance after school, where, uh, where, where they are, university, are well, they being taught that stuff there or is it just in the water for them in their lives? It, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is the sort of Foucauldian th- uh, philosophy that you, you've yeah. studied somehow actually penetrated into the world of dance in, and not and not just in the, their ideas that are commonplace but rather that they're being taught i think a couple of things happened and, and, and there's a conclusion of what's going on particularly in the arts at the moment in, in the conservatoires um obviously when when people started like having to pay their own fees and students started being called clients or customers rather than students and so the power of those students and the retention became all pervasive and then you have this kind of like, you have this grievance culture, this complaint culture, this anonymous complaints mm-hmm. culture. Now, when I was at dance school, I would say it was too far the other way. And it was it was tough. It was really tough. I, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to go back to that way of teaching. However, there's too been... Too tough sort of, in, in what sense? In oh, the, the authoritarian t- teachers? Very authoritarian. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a wrong and a right and that's it. And that's right. final. Um, you know, na- now it's probably gone a bit too far the other way in that, there's a rejection of any kind of level of authority or or also there's like this sort of wider rejection of experts or expertise mm. and 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 there's a lot to do about people's feelings and emotions and there's very little kind of like knowledge based mm. sort of study that you can only have i mean i actually I don't really care too much about these emotions and feelings you need to fill yourself with as much knowledge as possible yeah um what was interesting about romeo and juliet was actually the dancers that came through different training strands so either through hip-hop or through South Asian dance like Baranyatin or or Katak dance they didn't have these beliefs um it was the dancers that had gone through the conservatoires Mm. so I do think there's something about um you you know luxury beliefs Mm. luxury belief systems that 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 people hang on to there's definitely a sort of culture of who's the most oppressed um, and, and I just don't really have any, I'm not really interested in that. I mean, I mean I've yeah. worked with really difficult inner city schools and students and the arts are brilliant at, at like, you know, expanding people's worlds. Yeah. I'm not going to, I want to, I want to do that kind of work, not sit down yeah. and, and navel gaze ourselves. That's not what the arts are for. I also think there's a real lack of good teaching about what the arts really are for. Mm. Like, like the deep meaning of what arts actually do in society. We are here to shock. We are we are here to sort of like peel back the eyelids of people and take a society out of inertia and yeah. out of complacency. That's what we're here to do. Absolutely. And you look at the best art that changed the world, like there's uh, Sacre de Printemps uh, by, by Nijinsky or, or um, even, you know, the Marquis de Sade or, you know, other shocking people, the young British artists of the 90s, you know, it, it shocked us all. And it shifts society. Yeah. Being told to shut up, <laughs> you're not allowed to speak, or you, or we're going to keep you under a control where you're never allowed to speak again. That's impossible for me. It's yeah. just impossible. I wasn't going to do it. So that, so to go back, that's why I resigned. It's, you've resigned, and you're now, as I said earlier, relaunching or launching K2 Co. Yes. Oh, is that is that uh, Rosie K 2.0? 
company. Is it, <laughs> have I understood that right? Well, it, well it's, the K is important because um, my grandfather's real name was Kwiatkowski. Um, and Kwiat is flower in Polish, but it gives the letter K. And there was quite a lot of anti-Polish feeling when my grandfather and grandmother had to stay in Scotland. They wanted to go back to Poland, but they couldn't. Um, so the letter, a family name became K. Um, and so the K is important. Yes, it's my second company and yeah. um, it's, it's, a, it's a new start. It's a fresh start. And what was, what was lovely and, and shocking to me in January, after I'd sort of recovered a bit, like you say, it's just hugely, um, like physically takes so much out of you. I hadn't mm. eaten for weeks. I was sort of shaking and vomiting. It was awful. Oh, um, I, once I recovered and slept, I just had this explosion of like the new work I wanted to make and just oh, great. being really brave and going like, I'm going to focus on women, on sex, on gender. I'm going to go for it. And I wrote this trilogy of works and felt really happy about it. And then slowly, slowly just started talking to theatres, directors, programmers, saying, you still interested in my work? And people are. So. Oh, great. <laughs> and so what will the first work be? Will it be Orlando? Well, so so I'm going to tour Five Soldiers next year because I think that's just a really good piece that sort of, for anyone who hasn't seen my work live, it, it gives you a taste of, you know, what, what it is I do. Um, the first part of the trilogy is going to be called um, Deep Fake. And I'm looking at bodies, a woman's body identity. What happens if your actual physical body becomes obsolete and your digital self is more important than... Deep fake stuff is so spooky. It's so Absolutely spooky. terrifying. It's yeah. mad. I hope you haven't experienced any. Or... Fortunately not, yeah. no, no. But it really, like that, I, I've worked with like cyber experts and um, you can now fake people's voices. So like you, you could get your mum calling you up saying, I've been oh. kidnapped, I need ransom. And it's utterly convincing as your mum's voice. And this, this is, is post, post-truth world we're in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So you've written, what, the part one of your trilogy is... Is deep fake. Deep fake. And so I'm, I'm busy in the studio experimenting with that and trying to find like this kind of new, really weird, slightly poppy, odd language, disembodied language. Yeah. Um, I made a piece called MK Ultra about brainwashing uh when would that be about like five six years ago and so this feels like the one the next one it's like like you say like when i was talking about conspiracy everyone was saying oh you're bonkers we're we're way past conspiracy now like reality is conspiracy it's just (laughs) yeah weird so that's the first part and then the second part will be orlando and i think that's like super theatrical really over the top i think really funny i mean really funny a comedy probably (laughs) Great. Well, I'm I'm very excited. I'll, I'll be there. Uh, Brilliant. I look forward to uh, seeing them, and I hope that um, uh, you, your story gives succor to uh, many other people who feel like they have to self censor and, and feel like they can't, um, you know, express themselves uh, truly. And and um, perhaps your new company will be a home for for them and and other people in the dance world to come to. Well, I hope so. So. Um, that that's one of the things I've been working on with my my new advisory board is is we're going to put together a charter of creation and and it, it's really like you don't have to sign it it's not a policy it's not an employment policy but it's something that just says this is a place where you're safe to speak to think to challenge ideas no one will be silenced nobody will be cancelled we're here to work together for the purpose of art we're here to understand what the purpose of art is and let the audience be our judge. You know, you make the work and let let the people judge you. Let's not judge ourselves before we've made the art because we're not going to make anything, are we? So a freedom of expression charter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've I've thought a lot about this because because you you hear these things, oh, freedom of speech is a cover for the right wing or something like this. But actually, I trace it right back to freedom of thought, freedom of conscience. Yeah. You know, people died for this, for freedom of conscience. Then you have, once you've gone through the thought process and your conscience, then you have the, the area of expression, which is the arts. And for me, you know, that's, that's dance, so I'm not yeah. speaking. But then actually here we are, and speech is vitally important. Yeah. Because to be silenced and to be terrified and to be scared, to have your livelihood threatened so much, we're on the cusp of something. I don't think it's inevitable that it carries on down this route. It's not inevitable. I see a lot of hope, however, it is a dangerous moment. And so I wouldn't, you know, 
it's certainly not nice what happened to me. It's, it's awful. I'm not going to deny that. But also I would want to say to other people, do what you can in your own way to speak out and to resist. Yeah. Um, it can be tiny or it can be big. Um, but we, we need to have a pluralistic society and, and a tolerant society. And that's what I love about, you know, so much of the Western canon is, is, is based on that explosion of ideas and the testing of ideas. Yeah. Well, Roshke, that is absolutely the world I want to live in. So <laughs> more power to you. And um, uh, I very much look forward to watching uh, your new company blossom, bloom, grow. And um, it's going to be great, I'm sure. So Thank congratulations. You. Thanks. Thanks.